Good morning. Um, welcome to um, ABEM's uh, webinar uh, to provide information on our new virtual oral exam. Uh, my name is Carl Chudnovsky and I'm the chair of the Test Administration <laughs> Committee. And I'm, I'm happy to be here this morning to update everyone on, on our progress. Um, I'd also like to thank you all for taking the time to be here. We know that everyone has a busy schedule, particularly now as, as the pandemic seems to be surging across the country again. And I'm sure all of you are working very hard and we appreciate your service and for you being here today. And I'd also like to thank you for your patience during this, this process. Um, the pandemic has uh, you know, um, been difficult for all of us and certainly um, it's created a, a our inability to provide the oral exam, as you know, in person. Um, and um, so we appreciate your patience as ABEMS uh, work through the process of, of developing this new oral exam. Uh, so without any further ado, um, let's move on and let's talk about our new exam. So the purpose of the uh, webinar this morning is to provide all of you with an update on the development of our virtual oral exam ex uh, examination. Um, I'm gonna provide uh, an overview to start, uh, discuss the format of the exam, because I know you all have questions about that. And uh, we're going to show you a demonstration of one of the new case types that you will be seeing uh, during the administration. We often get uh, questioned about why ABEM still has an oral exam. Uh, and there are some very good reasons for that. Um, the oral exam measures different elements than the QE or the written exam. Um, as you all know, uh, our exam content comes 100% from the EM model. The building blocks of the exam is something we call KSAs which stand for knowledge, skills, and activities. Um, and we, we, we assess the most important knowledge, skills, and activities that emergency physicians must have. Um, when we look at our exams, we find that 36% of those knowledge, skills, and activities are not tested on the qualifying exam. We aren't able to test them in a written exam format. And, and that's why we have the oral exam. The oral exam tests things like uh, empathy, decision-making, complex reasoning, data acquisition, problem solving, clinical judgment, uh, a variety of things that we just cannot test on the, on the written exam that are very important to the practice of emergency medicine. So that's why we continue uh, to have an oral examination. So let's talk a little bit about our new exam. As you all know, the spring and fall uh, in-person examinations in Chicago were canceled. That's left a backlog of approximately 2,300 board eligible physicians, i.e. all of you on the call today, um, who have passed the QE, uh, but are waiting to take the oral exam. But as you know, we've run into a number of challenges. Our e-oral platform, that's our platform that we use uh, during the in-person exam in Chicago, does not work remotely. So we could not use that. And as you might expect, Remote, uh, a remote exam is much more difficult to administer. Because of that, uh, ABEM uh, established a task force called the Virtual Oral Exam Task Force a number of months ago to uh, develop uh, and, and implement a new virtual oral exam. The task force has been meeting weekly for the last several months, and, and I'm happy to say, and the reason we're here this morning, is the exam has been developed and is ready for deployment. The first exam is going to be taking place in December. The dates are set. That's December, it'll be, it'll be December 16th through the 18th. We also plan to have three additional exams in the first half of 2021. There'll be one in early March, another one in mid-April, and a third sometime in either late May or early June. We have yet to determine the administrations for the second half of 2021. We are monitoring the state of the pandemic and, the, and vaccine development and deployment very closely. Um, and so that will help guide us on whether we continue in our current uh, virtual format or whether we, we switch back to an in-person or even some other type of format. Um, the other issue that we have is we don't know what the scalability of this new virtual oral exam is. That is how many candidates we can put through at one time and how many times uh, during the course of the year can we do it. And much of that is related to the number of examiners we have available to participate. Nevertheless, um, the virtual oral exam format will be the format we use during the pandemic. No decisions have been made about the oral exam format after the pandemic. 
we are we are discussing this and looking at all options. Uh, and ABEM will communicate the information to you over how we will proceed uh, as soon as the decision is made. Something to keep in mind, however, is even if we are able to return to an in-person exam, the prior format that we were using um, cannot sustain the number of candidates that we are seeing on a yearly basis now. So there'll have to be some changes regardless of which format we decide to proceed with. All right, I'm sure you're all, uh, all thinking about when am I gonna get scheduled? So let's talk a little bit about, the, about scheduling for this new virtual oral exam. So candidate schedule for the 2020 administrations who were canceled will be the first scheduled for the new virtual oral exam. And, and as you might expect, we're gonna try and get the spring candidates in first. All of those candidates will be randomly assigned to these uh, next several administrations. The December uh, candidates, those who are, have been assigned to take it in December, um, they were already notified and would have received an email with instructions on how to register for the exam. If you were not, if you were not notified that you will be able to take the exam in December and you would like to do so, uh, I strongly recommend that you contact ABEM and get on the wait list that we've created for that December exam. Uh, I'm sure that there'll be some candidates who, for whatever reason, won't be able to take it in December, and we need to fill those slots and we'll do so from a waiting list. So if you'd like to take it in December uh, and you were notified that you didn't get a slot, please let us know and we will put you on the wait list. Candidates for the first three uh, administrations in 2021 will be notified early in January, likely sometime during that first week of January. Notification will consist of an email that will give you all the instructions you need to get registered for that exam. All right, so more about scheduling. Let's talk about the exam day itself. So we plan to have two exam sessions per day. Each session will take about three hours. Uh, we have allotted 25 minutes for each case, which is a little longer than our typical in-person exam, but we wanted to be sure that our examiners had enough time to administer, uh, score the exam, and, and move from uh, uh, Zoom room to Zoom room. So basically, you will have 15 minutes to complete each case. That has not changed. And the examiners will be allotted five minutes to score and five minutes to transition to the next case for a total of 25 minutes. There will be one 10 minute break uh, in every one session. And unlike our in-person exams in Chicago where candidates move from uh, hotel room to hotel room to take the different exams, in, this, uh, in the virtual exam, uh, candidates will, re will remain stationary. That is, you will be placed in a Zoom room and you will stay there. And the examiners will go from Zoom room to Zoom room. So a little bit different. All right. So what kinds of tests are you gonna be seeing? So there'll be no triples uh, in the virtual oral format. Um, you will get uh, seven total cases. There'll be six single cases, which I will discuss in a moment, and one new case, again, which I will get to, called a structured interview case. Each case will be administered by one examiner. And for the virtual oral exam, um, we're gonna be using only static stimuli. That is, there'll be no moving ultrasound images um, or videos. They, all the stimuli will be static. In addition, the stimuli will be listed on the screen. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, because we're using a Zoom platform, the examiners will be sharing their screens with the candidates. On the screen for the single uh, cases, there'll be 12 stimuli listed and labeled one through 12. And for the uh, structured interview case, there'll be six stimuli labeled one through six. Each case may have one, five, 10, or 12 cases, uh, 12 stimuli in the singles. Um, you'll have no way of knowing that. And this is our way of making sure that we don't inadvertently give anybody any additional information. But because the screens need to be shared, we have to have them on the, on the screen at all times. Let's talk a little bit about the single cases. So these cases are gonna be very similar to cases at previous oral exams. The content and the format is identical to the pre-oral cases. Um, and, and so if your residency program uh, provided uh, practice sessions based on our uh, previous exams uh, in Chicago, then they will be right in line with these six, uh, uh, what we call paper cases that you'll be receiving. So identical, and you should be uh, ready for those if you've been practicing uh, using the old uh, format. The biggest change uh, in the virtual oral format is that stimuli again will be on the screen 
Uh, we won't be passing you um, uh, paper uh, stimuli or uh, EKGs. Everything will be on the screen. You will not be able to directly interact with those stimuli. In other words, you will not be able to click on, on a stimuli and open it up. They'll be on the screen, again, labeled either one through 12 or one through six, depending on which format you're in. And the examiner will click on those stimuli so that you can see them, so you can visualize them uh, as the case goes on. You will be able to enlarge them uh, if you want to make them bigger, like an EKG or an X-ray, but you won't be able to open and close them. If you want to see a stimuli that you had looked at previously, so if you look at an X-ray or an EKG, and towards the end of the case, you'd like to revisit, all you need to do is ask the examiner, and they will bring it up on screen for you to relook at. Let's talk a little bit about this new case, the structured interview case. ABEM is using this opportunity to uh, innovate and leverage uh, new types of cases. Um, the structured interview case is basically a structured discussion between you and the examiner, and it follows the approach to workups that you perform in the emergency department every day. Uh, the idea be behind the structured interview case is to really assess uh, your, your thought process, to understand why you did something. And so in, in the structured interview format, you're going to get a lot of Dr. Brown, why did you order that CT scan in this patient? Or Dr. Smith, you ordered a CBC. How is that helpful to you? Um, it'll give you an ability to explain your thought process, um, really kind of showing your work verbally, so to speak. Uh, and we believe it's going to be the first time that we've been able to directly assess um, how you think uh, about a case. And I think it's going to be very, uh, very helpful in, in assessing uh, your abilities. I think the best way to understand the structured interview case is to see one online. Um, so we have a demonstration that I'm going to ask uh, Shelby to tee up next. But I also want to remind all of you that, that this demo that you're going to look at today is available on the ABEM website, along with a demo of one of the, the uh, um, paper cases uh, that will be on or type that will be on the, the virtual oral exam. And you can log on to the ABEM website and, and watch either of these or both of these at your leisure after this. So let's go ahead and start the video and you can take a look at the structured format. Good afternoon, doctor. This is a structured interview case. You will have 15 minutes to complete the case. Before we begin, do you have any questions? No, I don't. All right, you are asked to see Mr. Parker a 42-year-old man with epigastric pain and vomiting for the past six hours. When you walk in the room, you see a middle-aged man who is uncomfortable and vomiting. The nurse hands you this admitting form. Vomiting six hours, uncomfortable, no history of GI disease, pain and nausea quickly, sharp, unremitting and radius to the back. 10 out of 10, no history of surgery or comorbid medical conditions. He's a little hypertensive, tachycardic, but otherwise unremarkable. Okay. Right. Based on this presentation, what additional historical information would you want to ask the patient? Well, I'd, I'd want to confirm that, um, in fact, he's never had any symptoms like this before. He has no history of gastrointestinal disease, but, but um, never anything like this before. I'd want to know about his past medical history, particularly a history of hypertension, since he's a little hypertensive here, and if he truly takes any medications. Um, I'd want to know what he was doing when the pain started, um, if he finds that anything makes the pain better or makes the pain worse. Um, Sharp abdominal pain. I would want to know if he's, um, you know, he's vomiting. I'd, I'd want to know what that vomitus looks like. I'd want to know his last bowel movement and what color the last bowel movement was. Um, I'd like to know his social history, if he's a smoker or a drinker, or if he uses any illicit drugs. Um, I'd like to get a family history, and I'd also um, like to get a history of um, unintentional weight loss um, over the last number of months. All right, doctor, thank you. You asked about previous episodes or past medical history. Um, why? Well, I think the best predictor of the, his diagnosis today would be previous diagnosis of the same or similar. 
All right. You also asked about alcohol use. How is that helpful to you? Uh, I think the the alcohol use is important because it can affect the GI system in a number of different ways. It can be a direct irritant to the stomach. Uh, It can be associated with nausea and vomiting, and that can give um, even uh, erosive esophageal problems. Um, It can um, exacerbate other types of hepatic dysfunction. Um, If he's a longtime drinker, um, it can really um, cause liver dysfunction and increase the risk of GI bleeding, and it can also cause um, inflammation of the pancreas. All right, thank you. Um, The patient does drink alcohol infrequently, but drank heavily for him last evening. He had six beers and two shots of tequila. He has no known history of gallbladder disease. Based on what you now know, what specific physical exam findings would you be looking for? Well, I'd clearly um, start with how he looks in general. Um, does he does he look sick? Uh, is he pale? Are his mucous membranes pale? Are his mucous membranes dry? Is his mental status okay? Um, I'd do a heart and lung exam. Um, I'd certainly do an exam of his uh, abdomen. I'd look at the abdomen first. Then I'd auscultate and I would palpate the abdomen. Um, I'd do a rectal exam and check for occult blood. I'd, um, I'd do a GU exam um, as well. Um and I just make sure that he was moving all extremities normally. All right, doctor, you indicated that you would uh, auscultate the uh, abdomen. Um, how is that helpful? Well, I think a sudden onset of uh, nausea and vomiting um, can be a sign of a bowel obstruction. Um, so I would want to make sure that he had bowel sounds. If they were high-pitched bowel sounds, I'd be more worried about a mechanical obstruction. If he uh, bowel sounds were absent, I'd worry about an ileus, whether that was from medication or from um, some other cause. All right, doctor, and you indicated that you would want to palpate the abdomen again. How is that helpful? Uh, well, I want to make sure, it, it, given his, I, I, hopefully, I would be able to tell, uh, given his body habitus, if he had a pulsatile abdominal mass, if this was doesn't sound like a triple A, but clearly thinking worst first, um, I would think about a vascular emergency. Um, I would also want to see how tender he is and exactly where he's tender. So looking for peritoneal signs. I'd also check and make sure that there wasn't specific tenderness, despite him complaining of tenderness in the mid epigastrium in the right upper quadrant, or that he had a Murphy sign. All right, doctor. Um, The patient is slightly diaphoretic and appears to be uncomfortable and nauseated. Oral mucosa is dry. There is moderate epigastric tenderness without rebound. Bowel sounds are normal. Stool is negative for occult blood. And the vascular exam is normal. Based on what you now know, what are the top three items on your differential diagnosis based on the most likely conditions? We see this pretty sick with an epigastric pain. I, I, I think I'm going to focus on the, um, gosh, it could be, it still could be a lot of things. So um, could be peptic ulcer disease, could be gallbladder disease, could be his pancreas. Not typical for mesenteric ischemia, but it could still be mesenteric ischemia. Um, could be gastritis. Um not typical for primary hepatitis with a sudden onset, but that's still a possibility. Um, how many more would you like me to give? Well, actually, doctor, if you would, I'd like your top three only, please. Um, okay. Um, I think this could be peptic ulcer disease. Pancreatitis, um, with or without a gallstone, or um, I'm still going to leave mesenteric ischemia on. Great, doctor. Thank you.
Based on what you now know and the working differential diagnosis that you just provided, what, if any, diagnostic studies would you order? Um, I'd like to get a CBC and a BMP. I'd like to get liver function tests and a UA. I'd like an EKG and a troponin. And I, I'd like to get either a right upper quadrant ultrasound or a CT abdomen and pelvis. I guess given the location of his pain, I'd like to go with a CT abdomen and pelvis. I don't think a right upper quadrant ultrasound. Yeah, CT, CT abdomen and pelvis. All right, doctor, thank you. Um, you ordered a BMP. Um, why? Well, his... Um, I think that his volume contracted given his tachycardia and the oral mucosa findings on his physical exam. So uh, I would want to make sure that he doesn't have an acute kidney injury associated with the volume contraction. All right. And uh, similarly, you ordered a CAT scan. How, did, how would that help you? I, I think given the two diagnoses that are at the top, I, I guess I could have gotten a chest x-ray to make sure that he didn't have free air, but he doesn't really have peritoneal signs. So I think a CT would tell me more about um, gastric as well as pancreas and biliary um, disease than just a right upper quadrant ultrasound. So um, it would it would definitely show me free air. It would show me... Um, gallstones, I might get a, an estimation of the common bile duct, and it would give me a general look at the pancreas as well as the, a look at the vasculature. All right, doctor, um, here are the results of the lab and imaging studies. Okay, a little bit of a white count. Hemoglobin looks normal. Mm -hmm. Well, lipase and amylase. Mm -hmm. Very pancreatic death stranding. Okay. All right, doctor. Um, uh, based on what you know now, what treatment, if any, would you order? I would um, start IV fluids. I'd give a mm, liter bolus, reassess after the liter for a second liter. Um, I would give him some antiemetics. Um, some medication for pain, and I would make sure that um, nursing is aware that uh, he needs to be kept NPO at this time. All right, doctor, you ordered uh, IV fluids. Um, why? Um, well, his physical exam with the tachycardia and the dry mucous membranes is consistent with volume contraction, and those are really borne out in his labs with a uh, bicarb of 17, um, mildly elevated um, lactate, and a BUN to creatinine ratio of over 20 to one. So um, I think he would benefit from IV hydration. That, and I'm gonna be keeping an MPO, so he's gonna need maintenance fluids anyway. All right, and um, why would you reassess the patient? I, I think I need to reassess his vital signs, but I also think that um, this lactate is elevated and um, I think it's going to be important to trend lactates on him to make sure that we're doing adequate resuscitation. So reassessment to me means not only vital signs and clinically, but I would repeat his labs in a couple hours. All right. Thank you. Based on everything you know about this case, what is your final diagnosis? Uh, primarily given the CT findings in his labs. I think it's acute pancreatitis, but um, don't see evidence of common bile duct obstruction. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's good, thank you. Based on what you, you know now, what should the disposition of this patient be? Yeah, he needs to be admitted, probably admitted to a, a, a step-down unit or at least a monitored bed, someplace where there's um, adequate attention to him. Okay, why would you admit him? Um, for, for a number of reasons. Um, I'm, I, he needs to stay MPO um, for pancreatic rest. Um, he's going to get IV fluids, um, 
probably has going to have a continued need for parenteral pain medication as well as antiemetics. And um, I think most importantly, he's going to need serial abdominal exams. He doesn't seem to have any surgical complications of pancreatitis uh, yet, but we need to trend his labs, including his H and H, and um, and follow serial abdominal exams along to make sure he doesn't have any uh, complications. All right, thank you. Um, based on the disposition that you chose, which is to admit this patient, how would you hand him off? Uh, well, I'd, I'd, I'd reassess and see how he's doing, and and put in labs in a little bit of time. Um, I think though. He can be admitted to medicine, so I would I would make sure that the um, the admitting team or the admitting physician um, knows that I have a I have a middle aged gentleman with no significant past medical history um, presenting with acute epigastric pain, and it's consistent with pancreatitis, not associated with gallstones, but probably secondary from his acute alcohol use. On presentation, he was tachycardic and hypertensive, but in pain uh, and afebrile. But his workup has shown an elevated lipase and amylase. Um, CT consistent with pancreatitis with peripancreatic stranding, uh, but no evidence of hemorrhage. Um, I've treated him with IV pain medication, started IV fluids, and he needs serial abdominal exams. And um, I would ask them if they had any questions about his care or needed any clarifications. All right, doctor, thank you very much. That ends this structured interview. Thank you. All right, so that gives you a good idea of what our new structured interview cases uh, will be like. Again, if you'd like to view this again or view a demo of the paper cases, this, the traditional case, uh, you can go to the ABEM website. The other thing I'd like to mention now, I should have probably said it earlier on, uh, it was in the initial uh, slides that you saw while waiting for the webinar to start. Um, but if you have questions as we go, please feel free to put them in the Q&A section of the, of the webinar. The chat room, uh, as you know, has um, been turned off for the webinar. Um, some of those questions will be answered by um, individuals from ABM staff who are monitoring that question and answer room. Uh, and then I will address what the, the, the number of questions that I have time for at the end um, during the webinar. So if you have questions, please go ahead and, and, and put them in the Q&A. Also, if you have questions that are very personal to your situation, um, and, and you don't feel comfortable putting them in the Q&A, um, you can notify uh, ABEM uh, either through email or call, and we'll try to get those answers for you uh, as quickly as we can. All right, talk a, a little bit about some of the security considerations for this new exam. Uh, again, this is still a high stakes exam. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we want to be sure that we have the right processes in place. Um, candidates will not be allowed any external assistance at all. So that means no one else can be in the room. Um, you can't have textbooks, cell phones, other computers to look at things like up to date, um, no outside assistance. We're going to ask you to find a, a private, quiet testing location uh, so that you can take the exam undisturbed. Uh, prior to the exam, you'll need to attest to the exam policies. Uh, and basically, this exam is being given on the honor code, um, and we're relying on every candidate's personal integrity. Um, just a reminder that violations uh, of the honor code uh, will have consequences, um, as do uh, all of our other exams. All right, the exam is going to be administered using a Zoom platform, as you know. Um, we will be providing technical support for the Zoom meetings and breakout sessions. Uh, and you'll be receiving information on that prior to uh, the time that you'll be taking the exam. Uh, each candidate will have uh, a, a tech check ahead of the exam. Um, and we plan on having something we're calling a virtual event center, uh, kind of like the, the elevator lobby uh, at the Chicago here Marriott Hotel, um, where you can park yourselves uh, and where you'll have your session appointments listed. Um, and we are planning on recording all sessions. So we will be able to go back and look at them um, to be sure that they were administered appropriately or answer any questions or concerns that, that may come up after the exam. All right, we plan on having a candidate check-in process and we have uh, an outside vendor that's going to be helping us with that. 
Um, we'll be doing a systems check to be sure that all of your applications are either closed or turned off. And of course, we need to make sure that we are testing the right person. So there will be an authentication uh, segment to this. Uh, we will be taking a virtual scan of your environment using uh, your uh, camera on your computer. We also plan on having proctors that will circulate through the Zoom breakout rooms just to kind of see what's going on and keeping an eye on everything. Uh, and then uh, as we do for all of our exams, our ABEP staff does a really nice job at patrolling the web for exam content. All right, uh, prior to the exam, we are gonna provide you with a, a number of pieces of information. Uh, all, of the, all of you will receive a candidate note sheet. Um, uh, you'll get a list of normal lab values because they will not be on the stimuli that you receive during the exam. You'll get a list of common abbreviations and we will send you some more information because it is new regarding the SI format and information about how you will be scored on the SI case. We will ask you to destroy, rip up, shred your notes uh, on camera at the end of the exam session. All right, again, um, talk a little bit about uh, some of the technical considerations. Um, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, we we're gonna ask you to find a private, quiet, distraction-free testing location. You will need a laptop or desktop computer. You will not be able to take the exam on, um, on an iPad. Your laptop or desktop must have a camera and a microphone. Uh, we recommend if you have one uh, to use headphones that have a microphone so that you have your hands free for taking notes um, it just makes it a little bit easier for you. You will need a, a reliable high speed internet connection, um, at least one and a half to two uh, megabytes per second. Uh, for those of you who are planning on taking it in the hospital, uh, we strongly recommend that you test uh, your hospital firewall first. Many institutions uh, have very thick firewalls and it may make it difficult to actually take the exam from the institution. So if you're planning on doing that, please be sure that, that your firewall uh, or the firewall from your institution does not um, negatively impact your ability to, to take the exam. Uh, remember that examiners will be sharing their screens with candidates. You will not be able to directly interact with the stimuli. All right, uh, that's really all I have uh, on the virtual oral exam. And um, Kathleen Ruff has been monitoring the Q&A. And um, so I'm gonna see if I can answer some of those questions that, uh, that are burning in your mind now. Great, Carl, thank you. So we've had a number of questions come in about why we are keeping the oral exam. Why is ABEM continuing to have the oral exam? Um, and then also why are they continuing to require us potentially to go back to an in-person format if that's what we're gonna do? All right, so let, let me start with the first question, which is why ABEM continues to have an oral exam. And I mentioned this at the very, very beginning of the talk. Um, you know, we, we need to assess every candidate's ability to practice emergency medicine, to be a competent emergency physician. And as I mentioned earlier, the qualifying exam, that is the written exam with multiple choice questions, cannot test some of the skills, knowledge, and ability that are required for emergency physicians to be competent practitioners. Again, things like data acquisition, problem solving, clinical judgment, interpersonal skills, your ability to manage multiple patients simultaneously, that just can't be tested, or well, those things can't be tested on the written exam, but yet are very important uh, to the practice of emergency medicine. So because of that, um, that's, that, that, that's really the reasons we have the, the oral exam. Again, 36% of the knowledge, skills, and activity that, that are important for emergency physicians to possess cannot be tested on the, on the written exam. Um, so that's the answer to the first one. The second one is we have not made any decisions yet. As I mentioned earlier, um, we may continue with a virtual format. Um, we may want to go back and have uh, an exam in Chicago. There may be the ability to do both. Um, no decisions have been made. Uh, as of right now, uh, we will continue the virtual format at least until the pandemic uh, allows us to do otherwise. We will take a look at how the results of the virtual exam uh, come out. Um, we'll get feedback from you, from our examiners, uh, and then make a determination about what is the best way to continue on with the oral exam. So right now, we don't really know. Um, and when we do, we will, we will bring this back to, to our candidates. We will have discussions uh, and allow you to ask questions and try to provide you with as much information as we can. 
There are also a number of uh, questions about the cost of the exam. The cost of the exam is uh, remains uh, what it was. And so the question is, <clears throat> why do we continue uh, to uh, have this cost given the fact that uh, it is now a virtual format? Uh, recognizing, of course, that uh, this is the cost is really attributed to the value of the, cert of the certificate and as part of the contribution of um, the overall uh, uh, certificate itself in terms of that value. So can you speak a little bit about uh, the cost issues associated with the oral? Sure. So um, the cost is the same. That is correct. Um, but, but, you know, ABEM does not get any, any financial support other than through the tuition for our, for our exams. Uh, to develop the, the virtual oral exam, um, to um, have an outside vendor working with us to have uh, the correct platform, all of those things are expensive to create. Um, and we still have, of course, our, our entire staff at ABEM uh, helping us do that. Uh, and they're, they're paid individuals. So things like uh, test development, uh, test administration, research, um, staff costs, all of those things are still present regardless of whether we have an in-person exam or not. And so we, we still need to have, have that uh, happen. Um, recall though, or remember that as at least for these exams, for the virtual exams, you don't have to travel to Chicago. And so there will be uh, cost savings for travel and hotel and things like that. So it should be less for all of you. Um, but, but to continue to have a, a good oral exam does cost money. Uh, the only money that ABEM gets is through through the um, uh, cost of the exams. And so for now, that's the way we are proceeding. So Carl, we've had a number of questions on the structured interview. Uh, so one of the questions is, is the structured case supposed to be a back and forth or should you give a list of questions up front? No, the, the, the idea of this case is to be a discussion between the examiner and the candidate. Um, the, the examiner will lead you through that discussion. They are all well-trained on how to do that. There are very specific um, uh, items that we are looking for in that discussion, uh, but it, it, it needs to be back and forth. We want it to be more of a kind of the workups you do every day in the ED and, and how you do them. But, but really we are getting at with this interview, um, we are trying to get at your thought process, your rationale, why you do things that you do. Uh, and we think that's gonna be very helpful in making a great assessment of your abilities as an emergency physician. So for the structured interview, it seems that you can answer the questions as if you're speaking to another physician and is using medical jargon okay? Is it expected? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. You are not talking to the patient during the structured interview. You are talking to another seasoned emergency physician. And so you can use and should use you know, medical jargon. We, we wanna know your thought process. So again, um, you're gonna get a lot of whys. Uh, you know, why did you order that test? How will that help, be helpful to you? you? You'll get a lot of those. Uh, we are looking for your rationale, but you're talking to an emergency physician. Uh, and so you can use medical jargon. Um, when, you're, when they ask you about how you would transition a case, um, you're talking to a physician. So feel free to, to use the jargon that, that, that works for you. So in um, these types of cases, I mean, normally in the emergency uh, department, you're uh, contacting a pharmacist or using up to date. Why wouldn't uh, an up to date resource or other resources be available to you for this type of exam? So again, uh, for the structured cases, we are really looking at your thought process, which shouldn't be affected by um, uh, textbooks or up to date. During the exam, if you, if you feel like, hey, I think the patient has disease A, I really don't remember what the treatment for disease A is, but I, I'm sure that's what he has and I would look it up, you can say that. I would look up the treatment for disease A, or I know I wanna give this particular medication, I can't remember the dose, I would look it up. You can tell that to the examiner, that's fine, but you just can't have external assistance in moving through the discussion. So is it recommended that we verbalize the things we note on the STEM for a uh, structured interview case? Um, you can if you want. Some candidates like to repeat the STEM and, and, and say it out loud, that's fine, but you don't have to. As I said, the examiners will guide you through this discussion. Um, and as you notice, there's some uh, discussion back and forth on history, on physical exam. You're gonna be asked for a differential diagnosis, uh, what tests you would order, uh, what treatments you would give, a final diagnosis. 
and then um, you know your disposition, and then the, based on what that disposition is, whether it's admitting or sending the patient home, you kind of be asked about how that transition will occur. Um, you don't have to repeat the stems; you can just be make this a natural discussion between you and the examiner. So, will there be reference ranges for labs results given in the structured interviews? So as I mentioned earlier, before you take your exam, ABEM will be sending you normal values for all laboratories. So you'll have that in front of you, uh, along with um, uh, abbreviations uh, uh, list as well. So you'll have, the, you'll have uh, all the information you need to know whether a lab is positive or high or negative or low. Can you speak to scoring? What is the criteria for scoring for cases and the structured interview case? So scoring for the six single patient encounters are identical to the scoring that we used uh, prior to the virtual oral exam. That's unchanged. The uh, scoring on the structured interview cases, um, um, well, first, let me just by saying, we will be sending you information regarding scoring. So we're gonna send that to you in writing uh, so that you'll be able to see how you're being assessed. But basically there are elements in each of those sections that I just mentioned um, that we feel it's important that an emergency physician uh, um, verbalizes to us. It may be a particular historical piece of information based on the case that you have or a particular part of the physical exam. Um, it may be um, the final diagnosis, et cetera. So um, if you hit those individual points for each section, you'll get a point. In addition, we are going to be asking you uh, your rationale, your thought process behind those answers. Um, and as long as that thought process process or rationale is appropriate to those correct answers and you get the majority of those rationales correct, you'll also receive a point for uh, your thought process. And at the end of the exam, your points get added up uh, and a passing score will be determined based on the results of everybody's exam. So are any of the stimuli going to be a bedside uh, point of care ultrasound as part of our physical exam or are all ultrasounds uh, an ordered test? Uh, in essence, like a CT versus an official ultrasound? So there may be cases, particularly with the uh, single uh, patient encounters where you may be shown a, a single ultrasound image to interpret, or you may be seeing a um, written result from like a radiologist. Uh, it could be one or both of those. There will not be dynamic images for you to interpret. On the simula uh, simulated uh, structured interview case, uh, there were several more stimuli that were not shown during the interview. Uh, during the single cases or the structured interview, will it show the list of stimuli and see that there are several stimuli that we never got to? I mean, how's that gonna work? All right, so remember, unlike the in-person exam in Chicago, we're sharing screens, the examiners are sharing screens with the candidates, which um, puts a little damper on what we can and cannot do with our stimuli. Um, because of that, every single uh, uh, single case encounter will have 12 stimuli listed on the screen. You don't know whether there's actually one stimuli, five stimuli, eight stimuli, you won't know that. Every single one will have 12 and the examiner will um, open uh, the ones that you request. You, you, there may not be 12 on, on, on all of them. You just won't know that. Similarly, for the structured interview, there'll be six stimuli listed for each case. There may only be one or two for that case, but all will have six. And by doing this, um, it, it, it uh, avoids inadvertent queuing uh, uh, for any particular case that, oh boy, there's, there's a bunch of more than I, I, I must have asked the wrong questions or I need, to, I need to do more tests because there's more stimuli. That is not correct. And that, that is not something that you should think. You should order the tests uh, and the imaging studies um, uh, that, that, you, that you want on that patient, regardless of the number of stimuli listed on the screen. That number is irrelevant. There may not be that actual number of stimuli. And I hope that's clear. Uh, and if, you, if it's not, um, again, I, I recommend going to the, to the website uh, and, and there's more explanation uh, on that uh, for each of those uh, case demos. So in the particular demonstration, I would not have pursued a CT abdomen um, pelvis in the pancre uh, pancreatitis uh, example. Would I be penalized for this? Not necessarily. Again, there are, there are certain parameters uh, in each of those sections that the case developer uh, feels that is most important for an emergency physician to ask, do, or order. Um, in that particular case, CT may not have been on there. 
Um, but yet that's what the candidate wanted to do. So um, I can say not necessarily. And, and remember, there's multiple sections and multiple scoring points within each section. So missing one particular uh, answer uh, or giving one wrong answer doesn't necessarily mean you're going to fail that, uh, that encounter. So how can you fail the structured interview? Well, as I mentioned, you'll be getting uh, points for each of the correct answers and the correct rationales. Um, and uh, while I don't have the scoring yet, because we haven't done this, you'll have to get a certain number of points on each case in order to pass that structured interview case. And then, of course, that's just one of seven total cases that you will be getting during the virtual oral exam. Um, and um, so if you pass all of the single encounter uh, paper cases and you potentially don't pass the structured interview, um, you still could pass the exam. Uh, so it has to do with the, your entire score. Uh, and that is yet to be determined. Um, our our um, psychometricians are working on that right now, and it will we will have a scoring uh, paradigm in place prior to the December exam. So there are a number of questions uh, on uh, technical issues. Uh, one of which was uh, how uh, soon, it, how much in advance are we going to email? Uh, information to candidates, uh, and that information will go to candidates uh, substantially in advance of their administration so that they will be able to print out the uh, uh, documentation. There is concern uh, that people do not have access, uh, readily access to printers, and so uh, we will take that into account. Uh, to help them in, uh, in that process. Uh, but there are some questions related to the browser. What kind of browser can be used uh, for, uh, for the exam? All right, so um, we recommend uh, using Chrome um, for this. However, there's really no, um, no mandate for any particular browser. Uh, Firefox would work, um, um, uh, Explorer would work. Uh, so um, any of those are fine. We we have found that uh, that Chrome does work the best, but you can use any of those. And how would they approach if there is a technical issue, uh, a Wi-Fi issue, um, a, a problem with the computer? All right. Well, I, I'm sure all of you by now have done many Zoom meetings, and you know that no matter how much you pre prepare in advance. Um, there's always the possibility of, of a technical uh, problem or even things like a brief interruption because someone walks in the room, even though you think you're in a private, quiet place. I mean, we anticipate things like that happening and we are prepared to manage those. Uh, we will be getting your cell phone numbers and we have all the examiner cell phone, cell phone numbers so that we can communicate uh, immediately during any exam session. If the, if the session has a brief, you know, a small, um, uh, uh, interruption, we will likely just continue that case on. If there's a significant interruption, either because of a technical problem or, or other uh, issue that, that really um, uh, either stops or, or prolongs the, our ability to administer that session, um, the chief examiners will be available immediately to, to make a determination of, of what to do next. We have a number of things uh, that we can go to. So we have backup examiners who will be immediately available and can go right into the candidate's room and, and provide the exam for them. We also have exam sessions, we call them makeup sessions, that are scheduled at the end of the main session. So if you were to miss an entire session for whatever reason, our entire exam, we can actually make that up on that day at the end of the session. And certainly if there's major issues with multiple exams, we may have to have you do uh, a totally different day. We're hoping that doesn't become a reality, but for simple things, we're gonna continue. For, for more significant things, you might get a backup examiner. We might ask you to stay a little later and have a makeup session, but we do have a variety of, of fixes in place should that happen. There were a number of questions uh, about and concerns about being able to find that private uh, quiet testing uh, type of location. Uh, for some folks, they were wondering if it's going to be a problem if, for instance, a coworker walks into a room or a roommate walks into a room um, and then leaves. Is that going to be disruptive? Will that end their exam? How, how will that work? I'm going to strongly recommend to all of you that you find a place that you can take this exam undisturbed. I am sure that if you talk to your residency director uh, or department chair, they can help find that place for you. Um, if you live in a place where you have roommates, um, if you have a room that you can lock the door in, 
um, so that you are not disturbed. Uh, that's going to be my strongest recommendation to all of you. Um, if, if you absolutely can't find a place, um, I'm going to suggest that you contact ABEM and, and let's talk about it individually. Um, we don't want people to walk in and disturb uh, the exam session. Uh, we think that's really important. So, um, you know, do your best to find a private secure location. And if you absolutely can't, after exploring all possibilities, let us know and we'll talk about some of the alternatives that we may be able to help you with. Uh, there are a number of questions uh, coming in about scoring again um, and related to the single cases and the structured interview. Uh, there's questions of whether the structured interview is going to be um, basically weighted the same as the single cases. Um, is one going to count more than the other? Is one worth more than the other? So as of right now, uh, and uh, for the for the foreseeable future, and I say that because we haven't we haven't provided this exam yet, and we haven't gotten any results yet. But for right now, um, it is not weighted any differently than the other uh, cases that that uh, you will be taking. So all cases are weighted the same uh, and will be graded um, as I mentioned earlier. Great. And can you uh, just go over? Um, also, there was a question related to. Um, providing enough time during the exam for a candidate to be able to look at the stimuli, like magnify it uh, if it's too small, uh, that kind of thing. Will that be, you know, will candidates be able to do that kind of uh, interactive with the stimuli um, during the exam if they need to see something that's really small? Sure. Um, so you will be given 15 minutes for the case and, and no longer. However, to, to magnify stimuli takes literally a second or two. Um, there is a magnification uh, uh, function on the Zoom platform. You can make things bigger or smaller at your leisure. That is, that is probably the only aspect of the stimuli that you will personally be able to interact with. And again, if you want to see a stimuli that was previously put on the screen by your examiner, all you need to do is ask them, hey, I'd like to see that admitting form again, please. Or, you know, can you put up the 